Hello fellow rogues and lockpickers. Today we have a treat. I'm going to be reading some, and by some I mean pretty much all, of the major fluff, the flavor text, the story, the character development of one of my favorite games, Trip Lock. Certainly easily one of my favorite abstract games. Certainly as well one of my favorite solitaire solo games. And just a real delight to play, both competitively or cooperatively with another player. Despite being abstract in its gameplay mechanisms and being a game of skill and strategy, luck and memory, the theme, the flavor, the story ekes through in very indirect ways through the beautiful components and the wonderful flavor text. So it's about a number of characters who have a number of different situations, rooms, scenarios, places where lockpicking is essential in the city of New London, in this beautiful, interesting, vibrant, and in many ways, terrifying steampunk universe. So let's start with the characters. For our first character, and I'll move this just slightly. We have Elizabeth Watkins, the anarchist. From her west side balcony, high above Newtown, Elizabeth Watkins watched the smoke belching from the chimneys on the streets. If she squinted, she could vaguely make out the silhouette of her childhood home in Old Town. A woman could see everything from up here, and it was her favorite spot to enjoy a quality cigarette. As she saw it, the tobacco smoke filling her lungs couldn't possibly be any worse than the air of New London. Besides, the nicotine buzz helped keep her on her toes. Being plucked from Old Town at the age of 16 gave a woman perspective. Elizabeth knew about the plight of the commoner. She knew that in Old Town, each day was about nothing more than survival. She knew how lucky she was, and it made her sick to her stomach. The captains patrolling the streets found her beauty enchanting and raved about her. Word of her mesmerizing eyes and divine figure made its way to Parliament, where young Senator Watkins demanded a quick and quiet marriage. It happened so quickly and quietly she was fairly certain the rest of Parliament didn't even know. She was from Old Town. They certainly didn't suspect foul play after Senator Watkins' recent death. And why should they? Elizabeth was so good at blending in with the politicians and elites of the royal company that everyone assumed she just belonged. On the back we have character development that's more about relating the character back to what is happening in the story of Triplock itself. One had been a vice that Senator Watkins loved more than anything. His nightly drunken fits revealed things about the city she had never known. Horrible things, terrifying things, on occasion useful things. Parliament's chief security engineer had developed a locksmith's manual of sorts for the locks of New London. A few under-the-table deals had earned the sender a copy. His assumption that a former resident of Old Town would be disinterested and unable to read such a tome was his biggest mistake. The poisoned wine took him quickly. Nobody but Dr. Lucius Elliot gave the cause of death a second time. Just another in a long line of senators dead from alcohol-related complications. Elizabeth suspected Elliot knew better, but he was so reserved she was confident he'd never say a thing. The doctors of Newtown were treated with much less respect than those living in the luxury of Royal Heights. The lockpicking manual was all hers now. After a few months of studying, 
There'd be nowhere off limits to her in New London Heights or the entire city. In his final moments of his life, the senator was delirious. He ranted and screamed, even, about prote uh, protecting the train station. Elizabeth peered over the balcony and lifted the binoculars to her eyes. The train station didn't have a mysterious way about it, with plenty of locks to practice on. Excuse me, it did have a mysterious way about it. Plenty of locks to practice on. Lowering the binoculars, she spotted a lovely wooden lockbox adorned with switches and keyholes sitting on the balcony next to her cigarette. How in the world? On the bottom, a time and place. The listed time was 2 a.m. The place was the train station. So, that's Elizabeth Watkins. Excuse me, sneeze. So dusty in New London. So much chimney smoke and steam. So, Dr. Elliot is next. The cryptanalyst. The royal company had become careless, and Dr. Lucius Elliot had been studying. 150 years of power in New London can leave folks feeling invincible. Propaganda and education had convinced them that there was never a reason to fear. Elliot was counting on this. The doctor made a living. Um, he made a decent living when compared to the typical local. It at least afforded him the opportunity to live in Newtown, set far from the stench of the open sewers. It was also one of the few areas that still had trees and parks worth a damn. Black Lung, of course, had no cure. The smog and rain in town caused innumerable health issues that the royal company had no interest in fixing. They paid doctors to lie to patients, just hand folks a placebo pill or a shot of morphine and send them on their way. They expire soon enough. The few who survived long enough to realize what was going on were deemed insane and hauled off to the asylum for their last days. But the authorities drank the same water. They breathed the same air. It was inescapable within a hundred miles of the city, and yet they never seemed to care. Lucius had realized this years ago. His keen eye and silent nature had allowed him to remain under the radar while tirelessly researching his environment. He'd been studying hard. The company guard captains seemed to spend an awful lot of time in the fifth ward, a nondescript building connected to the, tra by the, tra uh, connected to the train station was of particular interest. Decrepit and in a state of disrepair, it still was secured by several locks. No captain held all the keys, instead several, uh, several of them carried a single key to prevent anyone gaining access on their own. Picking locks was illegal in New London, for obvious reasons. However, Sick miners often knew a thing or two about it. They spent many of their nights trying to unlock, unlock their chains for an ill-advised escape attempt. They often had papers and books in their pockets when they arrived to Lucius' office. Books were contraband as well, but the miners were required to fix their carts and equipment with manuals. A bit of coal and manual were all that were needed to record the nightly progress working on the locks of their chains. He made sure to get what he could from them before they got their pills. Analyzing manuals consumed his nights. He knew more than the royal company could imagine. Deep in reading, the knocks on the door startled him. Whoever had knocked was already gone, but they had left a box on the doorstep. Ornate woodwork, gears, and toggles enveloped the box. Golden text on the bottom offered only a time and location. Did it mean tonight? This location listed was a dangerous place to wander at night, 
near the train station, where Old Town's stray cats seemed to gather. Like a cat, he could feel curiosity overriding his better judgment. Maybe it would kill him, too. Up next we have... Lottie Wentworth, Timeline Traveler. It's not often you meet someone so unfamiliar with their own history. However, it's also not often you meet someone who's been pulled through time and space as much as Lottie Wentworth has. Optimistic to a fault, Lottie spends her days doing whatever she pleases. Forced to marry the head of the royal company, Lottie's beauty and cheerful spirit have somehow allowed her to remain relatively free of typical spousal duties. Plucked as a teenager from the timeline she was born in, Lottie was subjected to life in a myriad of different realities. As the royal company acquired technology and wealth, she was allowed to do as she pleased. Repeated trips back to her timeline of origin, however, yielded mixed results. Every trip back seemed to change something. Uh, things started to feel hollow, black, and white facts about her life began to turn gray. She no longer knew her birthday. She couldn't name the town she grew up in, and she no longer remembered if Lottie was even her given name. A life of curiosity without family and mostly without memory, would have been enough to break the spirit of your average person, but not Lottie. She knew that someday she'd have a chance to escape, a chance to rip off the technology binding her to the royal company. Wentworth tracked her every move, but he was so busy that he was happy to let her explore whatever and do whatever she wanted. She liked to walk among the common people in each timeline they visited. No ma nobody had a clue who she was, so there was little danger. It was good for her soul to see people living their lives. Often, it gave her a better understanding of just how vile her husband was. She knew that eventually, her husband's willingness to let her do as she pleased could truly be used to her advantage. Acquiring weapons was impossible with the way she was tracked, but she had other ideas. She had free access to his machines and to his medicine, uh, his medicine cabinet. After all, she needed the medicine too. Time traveling, using compromised pills, meant almost certain death. She just had to figure out how to slip such a pill to her husband unnoticed. One of these days, she'd figure uh, one of these days she'd figure she'd um, she'd meet a few souls willing to help. True freedom may be just around the corner. We have two kind of arranged marriage, beautiful women murdered or murdered their husbands so far, but I guess that sort of thing must be par for the course in New London. Up next we have Dante Harvard, airship pilot. As they prepared to touch down, Dante wrinkled his nose and scowled. Flying the airships around the world had its perks, but the return trip to New London wasn't one of them. Even up in the clouds, you could smell the city miles away. Even the clouds themselves gave, they gave the city away curled to an unnatural shade of brown he hadn't seen anywhere else. The smell itself became a joke among the other elite royal company guards. Parliament and the royal company had made the deal together to make New London the hub of industry and innovation. London had never really recovered from the war. The announcement was Mintz uh, went over the airship uh, excuse me. The announcement went over like an airship without an engine. 
New London to celebrate our rebirth and partnership with the Royal Company, Senator Watkins had declared from the balcony over the town square. Nothing changed for Dante or for New London. He kept flying in the company's secretive shipments from around the country while New London citizenry continued living in despair with no hope of upward mobility. Meanwhile, the Royal Company got a new hub with no oversight. When it came to shipping in their strange cargo, Despite the city's stagnation, his employer's arrogance worked well for Dante and his co-pilot. He could steal and take whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. You could leave the ship on autopilot for hours without much worry. This afforded him the time to learn to break the locks on the tiny cargo bay at the back of the ship. The small crew ate like kings. They drank like kings. Nobody questioned oddities in the manifest as long as the safes were all accounted for. So many safes. Pickable safes, if you know what you're doing. Hours after his most recent touchdown, Dante hit up the cargo bay once more to see if he could uncover a bite and buzz. But all that was there was a wooden box. It had it an address and time inscribed. Oddly enough, the address was familiar, the same street as the destination of many of New London's hush-hush shipments. His ship, the Osprey, wasn't scheduled for takeoff until tomorrow afternoon. Maybe he'd wander over to Ambrosia Avenue and see what was going on. Airship quarters can leave a person restless. Cedric Castle, scientist. Assassination attempts on Royal Company elites were fairly commonplace. On occasion, one might hear rumblings of a low-level executive picked off by a stray bullet when they got a little too close to Old Town. But even those rumblings had a sort of tall tale character to them. The facts never came to light, and if they did, the rumors on the street obscured them to the point of relative meaninglessness. Zedric wanted to change that. Knowing the royal company specialized in the sciences, he devoted his life to working for uh, he devoted his life to working for them in order to take them down from the inside. As a science prodigy, he was quickly recognized for his genius and um, and elevated to the top rung of the Royal Company's labs. Before long, he was working side by side with the infamous Wentworth. Wentworth probably had a first name, but nobody had the guts to ask him for it. All of these lock pickers come from different backgrounds, but all of their destinies seem to be intertwined. Continuing, Wentworth brought Zedric to his personal laboratory and gave him a binding to move and stay put in whatever timeline he pleased, and their technological discoveries reaped the benefits. Stealing tech from one timeline helped advance the tech in another, and they gathered so much education and so many resources that they could have pulled every last gutter rat in New London out of poverty, but of course they didn't. Instead, Zed was put to work perfecting the all-important medicine. For most, hopping timelines led to disastrous and deadly results. Vomiting was first, usually followed by a series of aneurysms and cardiac arrest. Perfecting the pills didn't take long, but they required tremendous amounts of power to make. 
With coal being plentiful, it wasn't long before Zedric was helping oversee the utter decimation of New London's air supply and quality of life. He justified it by telling himself that once Wentworth was out of the picture, it would all be worth it. In his heart, however, he knew this wasn't true. His work had essentially destroyed an entire city, and his research had only further strengthened the royal company's ability to control the masses. Even worse, Wentworth grew suspicious of Zed's motivation, his motivations, and as Zed's latest projects drew to a close, so did his opportunity for assassination. Abruptly, Wentworth pulled the plug on Zen's all-inclusive building and became much more reclusive with fewer excursions and more time at his high-security estates. Zedric managed to retrieve new bindings, but his um, direct access to Wentworth was severely diminished due to his demotion to head entertainer, more like a court jester. Gives him cause for bitterness, one supposes. Axe Derringer, safe cracker. You can never be too careful working on the rails. Axel, Axe, Derringer would know. Most folks have five fingers on each hand. Axe used to be like most folks before his two decades on the Royal Company rails. With a thumb and a pinky uh, remaining on his right hand, and the pointed ring in middle, middle Axe's favorite, still available on his left hand, Axe had the equivalent of one decent mid. That was good enough for him. Switching tracks, fixing wheels and brakes, shoveling engine coal, and protecting the precious cargo. These were the duties of anyone working Royal Rails. The grunts on other rail lines might have a single focus, but the Royal Company trusted so few folks with their cargo that you had to be a jack of all trades to stick around more than a few weeks. Knowing everything about the sparsely staffed trains had its advantages. Axe knew the guards' schedules and could occasionally sneak from into some of the cards. Uh, some of the cards that were supposed to be off limits. This was a feat unto itself, with numerous chains and locks to bypass in order to gain entry. The cars often contained safes. Over the years, Axe learned what made these safes tick. He was remarkable. His hearing was shot. The roar of the steam engines wrecked his ears long ago. Axe had learned to crack safes strictly by feel and a few tools of his own creation. Call it a gift or call it luck, but he could crack any royal company safe in minutes. For all the extra sense Axe had for safe cracking, um, he sure couldn't make much of their contents. Sure, they were occasionally sacks of coins or cryptic codes written on notes, but more often he found vials of liquids or pills he could only assume were medicine. Sometimes blue, sometimes red. They were always in small quantities. On rare occasions, a bottle of pills would be alone inside the vast iron vaults. Of course, Axel would help himself to to a sip or a pill or two, whenever he pleased. If it was good enough for royalty, it was good enough for Axe. And while he didn't notice any benefits from his experimentation, he didn't notice any ill effects either. In fact, he felt at the top of his game. Axe assumed he'd found he'd be found out eventually, but nobody suspects the mostly deaf guy especially one who's missing half his fingers. While making his way through the cars one night, 
Axe noticed a small lockbox on top of one of the safes. A time and location glistened gold embossed on the bottom. He knew the address well, an unkept extension of a train area. The time was concerning. 2 a.m. was not the time to be near trains. But that didn't scare Axe Derringer. He figured the worst that could happen was losing another finger. Up next is Adeline Folly, secret agent. Most of the folks in New London had an air of paranoia about them. Adeline Folly took that paranoia and the social awkwardness that came with it to a whole new level. There were rumors that she had been a sharpshooter in the war. Well, that seemed at odd with her persona. Perhaps she had seen a few too many things to in, uh, integrate back into society. Nobody seemed to have a better explanation for her bumbling behavior. She couldn't look a soul in the eye. She couldn't walk a block without falling down. And conversation was out of the question. And then there was that hat. It looked ridiculous. Nobody could take her seriously. Perhaps this is what made her a great gun for hire. She dealt in the business of shadows and hitmen only talking to the few surviving members of her platoon. Most who came back had no use for traditional means of making a living, and even less use for the government. They had been trained to kill and spy their whole lives, so there was no sense stopping now. So Adeline joined them. Was it all an act? It was hard to say. Her military training allowed her to access, allowed her access to most any building. Nobody on the planet suspected she could have killed the fly. She'd go stumbling through the door of her ordered hit, and her target assumed that she was just a commoner with a mental illness who had lost her way. They never stopped to think about all the locks she had to break to make it that far. Not that they had time. They were dead before they could think more than, what's that on their head? As she prepared to leave the home of her latest, now late, target one night, Adeline's gaze stopped on a sturdy box of unique construction sitting on the victim's nightstand. It was wooden and well-made like the boxes she kept her military medals in. Very out of place for a simple train conductor. Turning the box over and almost dropping it in the process, she noticed something embossed in gold on the bottom. Adeline smiled and gave an awkward giggle. Ambrosia Avenue was close, and with her mark already pushing daisies, she had a few hours to kill. And now we have Charlie Beckworth, machinist. It takes a lot of work to get to the top of the royal company. Well, excuse me. It takes a lot of work to the get to the top of the royal company's most wanted list. I can talk. I'm one thing that's interesting about this game, as a side note, is everything's made of this beautiful, semi-glossy material. These cards are practically waterproof, but also with my lighting, it gives the glare on the text. Perhaps that's more of an excuse, though. Continuing. It takes a lot of work to get to the top of the royal company's most wanted list. A status like that must be earned. It takes dedication, some luck, and a good amount of slipperiness. It makes sense, then, that Charlie Beckworth spends her days covered in grease in her family's underground bunker. Her parents, Liam and Becca, were key cogs in the failed uprising 
1845. The Union Underground spent years designing machines and weaponry of all sorts in an effort to take back the railway, uh, the railway station and unlock the monopoly on coal and fuel. The results were fatal and disastrous, and they left Charlie an orphan with a home beneath the streets of Newtown. Charlie understood where and why her parents had failed. They needed more people, more weapons, and more machines. So she worked tirelessly, rebuilding and improving Becca and Liam's designs and automatons, automatons with a small group of machinists. I didn't realize that there were autom automatons in the fluff and theme and atmosphere of the world of this game. It's very cool, if I can pronounce the word. Continuing. Of course, acquiring food and the resources to build a new Union Underground required a vast network of people. Charlie ventured out most nights, sneaking around the Royal Heights, ascending the walls and stealing what she could. Most of the ground-level guards knew her by her name and appreciated the bribes of stolen goods she always seemed to acquire. The guards loved premium cigarettes, and Charlie knew, uh, and Charlie could grab two or three a day by scaling the west side tower and grabbing them from the balcony. This was a small price to pay for full access to the royal quarters. Her capture seemed to be inevitable, uh, seemed to be an inevitable monthly occurrence. The guards would lock her wrists with cuffs and march her through the cast iron gate, past the courtyard and down the steps to the jail. Days, hours, and sometimes only minutes would pass. The guards would fall asleep or swap shifts and Charlie would be gone, back to the bunker and back to work. Something felt different about tonight's escape. It was almost as if they let her go. When she arrived back home, a box was waiting for her. On the bottom, a time and location was inlaid with gold. 1400 Ambrosia Avenue, 2 a.m. A quick peek at her watch showed it was already 1.30. Time to go home. Last character. Madigan, the demolitionist. In the days following his escape, Madigan lost what little sanity he had remaining. The train station's coal mine was a tough place for tough men. Few bags could handle the physical stress of the long days. Few stomachs could handle the rancid rations passed around during the brief breaks. But neither of these things ever bothered Madigan. It was the sounds that broke him, the insistent jingling of the chains around his neck, the blasting in the underground depths, the shouting and fighting of his fellow crew. Around the clock, in his dreams, in his nightmares, he snapped. Otherworldly strength filled his body as chain was ripped from stone. The bullet from the Royal Company's rifles didn't faze him. He felt nothing as he grabbed the razor wire at the top of the yard fence and flung himself carelessly over the wall that had contained him for years. This was a tough person who broke free of slavery despite all odds. Hiding in the sewers of Old Town, he waited day after day those chains, he could still hear them. Echoes of dynamite still rattled between his ears. Groans and shouts of the workers and yard sergeants still carried through the tunnels, taunting him minute by minute. Something must be done about it. All the locks in New London worked the same way, with the right combination of explosives. The cleverness usually required to unlock something as complex 
as the gate to the mine would be negated in a fiery eruption of springs and gears. Madigan was sure the stone monolith that kept the commoners from rescuing their friends and family in the mines could be bypassed the same way. Maybe they'd hear him coming. Maybe the explosives meant for the mine bosses would uh, never find their target. Either way, Madigan would have his peace and quiet, and soon. While preparing his suicide mission, a box dropped through the manifest just above him. A simple message was inscribed in fine golden lettering. A time and a place. Tonight, over by the chemical plant, close to the mines. Just as good a place and time as any to begin his last stand. True freedom fighter. That's the last of the characters, and now we see that they're each being drawn to the station. Now, for how long I want this video to be, we'll see what we have time to get through, perhaps everything. But I will say that the station is the solo slash cooperative mission that comes with the base game. As expansions or as part of the Kickstarter pack, you can purchase these additional scenarios that also progress the plot and so forth. But clearly, what we can tell is that the character sheets point to the station being the first mission, the first situation that they find themselves in. However, what's not clear is if a chronology matters for the others. Now, each there's multiple rooms inside each of these missions or scenarios those that order is clear but what comes after the station is not clear so i'll start with the station with that being intuitive but after that it's possible that i will be incorrect about the order but we'll see the station everyone looked around uneasily no one person had reason to expect that he or she wouldn't be the only one here but something about the other five who'd showed up filled the air with tension. It also didn't help that this part of the station was well lit. They could hear the royal company, night watchmen, laughing and chatting, no more than a block away. Six people gathered awkwardly near the train station at 2 a.m. would draw attention, maybe even gunfire. Nobody said a word as they sized each other up until a voice behind them broke the silence. Welcome, a masked woman said in an, un, in an even, measured tone. I see none of you had issues opening your lockboxes. The keys inside, the keys inside is unique to you and you alone keep it close. Without another word, she brushed past them and up to the door. Even from where they stood, it was obvious the lock protecting the entrance was not normal. In fact, the keyhole itself was hidden from view behind a series of fake wall plates and failsafe triggers. And yet, with a ball pick and short hook in her right hand and a rake in her left, the woman sprung the complex lock in seconds. That kind of speed on that kind of lock was next to impossible. The entire group was dumbfounded, and she knew it. Inside, she instructed. Everyone quickly followed. The masked woman spoke again, even while the group still piled into the small, uh, small foyer of what looked to be the trains, uh, the train conductor office, conductor's office. Listen up, she said curtly. You are here because you are curious. This whole place holds many secrets. Ones I know you are interested in. You also know your way around the best locks in the city, half of which are built into this place and others like it. We will need all of us working together to overcome such obstacles, she continued. 
but first I must know your strengths and weaknesses. Pair up and face off against one another. She handed out intricate boxes covered with gears and le levers. There was a pause as the group tried to digest all that they had just heard. The click of a lever on Axis box and a sheepish grin on his face snapped into attention. The challenge was on. So we'll see if it seems necessary to do. Each scenario has a number of rooms, three, four, five, I suppose. On the front is the fluff and the plot and the story, which is what we're focusing on. On the back expresses how you play it, the mechanisms, the, the abstractions, and the rules for it. These are fantastic and necessary to play, but again, we may not be reading all of these, but the ones we do will just be the front with the story. The station, room one. She still didn't give her name, yet she knew each of theirs. Her elaborate metal mask was full of intricate patterns, diamond shapes, and studs looked as if it were permanently locked to her face. It's time, she said as she opened a panel on the back wall, exposing an intricate grouping of protected me uh, mechanisms that all rotated at unique intervals. Which one of you wants to put your skills to a real test? She asked. If you're the lucky one, take your room key and insert it in here. The station will only allow access to each key once per night. So, pass or fail, once you've attempted the lock, we won't have need of your skills again this evening. That's room one. Room two. The satisfying sound of locks releasing indicated success. Immediately, a rusty floor panel began to slide open, causing Charlie to jump sideways to avoid falling in. Follow me, was all they heard as the ornate silver mask disappeared from view down a steel ladder. Lead the way, stranger, Elliot replied, carefully setting foot on the metal rings. Others were less trusting, but no one could resist the mystery. And as soon, uh, and soon they were all down the ladder and into a room full of motion. Gears spun everywhere and steam filled the air, making the room feel alive. A control box on the wall to their left held a complex lock. This room has a mind of its own, the stranger remarked. It's a single massive machine built entirely to analyze and shut down attempts to bypass its defenses. Who wants a shot at this one? Now we have room three. Presumably, because in the rules, you only get to the next room if you complete the previous room for each of these scenarios, we can assume they are successful with the rules if we're continuing with the story naturally. Room 3. The lock released, and a circular door appeared across the room where none existed moments ago. The stranger led them through, uh, continuing to ignore all questions. The next room offered a marked contrast to its predecessor. Plain metal paneling covered every surface, and the group's voices uh, reverberated around it in a never-ending feedback loop. In the center of the room stood a console with several exposed mechanisms. It was time to choose someone. Console axis initiated. A gruff male voice boomed out as if broadcasted via loudspeaker. Though no such amplification was visible, a loud hiss and a blast of steam from above heralded giant replicas of the console. The console mechanisms descending from an opening in the ceiling. Across the room, a metal slab lowered, revealing a blurry figure and 
a matching console, both obscured behind tinted glass. The final room for the station, room four. There was a loud cacophony of grinding gears and groaning metal as the suspended machines were released and fell to the ground mere yards away, making a racket that had all of them covering their ears. In the commotion, the cryptanalyst disappeared. The stranger waded through the piles of twisted metal to a hatch in the floor that was now unlocked. She led them down yet another ladder, this one in noticeably worse shape than the last. They were now underground in what looked to be a cave. In the very center sat a small box wired into the floor. The stranger eyed the container with obvious familiarity. Inside that box is the kind of technology that only a thousand lives and a face can buy. She had paused, but it will take more than one to open. If we succeed, then the fun begins. Judging by her tone, she was wryly smiling behind the mask. That's the story of the station. Up next, let's look at the factory. The lid of the box in the station opened by itself, but without ceremony. Propelled by a trigger from within, the metal cover performed a single flip in the air and then changed loudly as it hit the floor. This clattering, however, was quickly drowned out by the sudden buzzing coming from inside the box. Smart sparks popped and sizzled from within. The stranger grabbed the cloth, um, the cloth handle of what looked like a large key. Lightning seemed to be weaving its way around and through it. Every time the stranger held it close to metal, the electricity lashed out with a hiss and gave a jolt to the unlucky object. Oftentimes, this sent items violently sailing across the room. She led the group up some wooden stairs while everyone ducked and dodged, electrified metal bits flying past them in her wake. After pushing a door open at the top, they were back at the street level, standing outside a massive factory that sh sprawled the lengths of a few blocks. Everything about it said, go away. A common feeling in this part of the city. <laughs> if you didn't work in the industrial district, you tended to avoid it. Even patrols skipped this part of town if they could get away with it. The station's trains could still be heard jockeying for a position on the track a few blocks west. The group had traveled quite the distance underground. Abruptly, the stranger walked up to the tall fence surrounding the massive factory, which was suffocating their view of the glowing horizon. She turned her face away as she jammed the still very charged key directly into the fence. The group watched in awe as 100 yards of steel mesh and razor wire lit up in a flash collapsing and melting before them. The pathway to the workers' entrance was clear, but no one made a move as they tried to process what they had just witnessed. Hurry, the stranger said. That will certainly draw some attention. She then carelessly hopped over the molten fence, as if simply avoiding a puddle on a rainy day. 
This all was getting quite strange. Well, it sure seems to me that the factory was intended to come next, and that's certainly probably listed somewhere as well. So if I get the order wrong for any others, please forgive me. But here we continue with our journey in the factory. They hurried uh, to the worker's entrance. Naturally, it was locked, uh, locked tight with a fairly standard royal company lock. That is to say, a lock complex beyond measure and not meant to be broken in this lifetime. Dogs barked in the distance, and a siren cut through the humid morning air. With zero sense of panic, the stranger stated plainly, The lock, one of you, now. The hum of machinery could be heard behind the door. Curious that there was activity inside at this hour. A voice behind them gave even the stranger a start. Am I late to this party? Madigan scoffed, barring his all too white teeth in an odd shaped grin. Got your invite, but had to deal with some noise first. Nice job on the fence, but I'd keep electricity far away from that lock. The factory room too. The group slammed the door behind them, and Madigan braced it with a steel bar. Turning toward the humming machinery, they quickly realized the room was fully automated. Conveyor lines filled the space with a web of movements while enormous generators seemed to uh, canvas the entire ceiling. The tech in the room was well beyond the capabilities of any New London engineer. Twisting snakes of electricity shot down from the generators into spires that in turn powered the conveyors. Boxes of pills and serums traveled along the belts, but they were too high to reach, and electrified rails on either side kept curious hands at bay. The power grid, however, was still operated by a standard switch behind a lock. Shut this thing off, the stranger said. We need to climb up there and grab some of those meds. The factory, room three. With the strange medication in one hand and the still sparking key in the other, the stranger led the group to a vault that stretched from floor to ceiling. Take one, she said, holding the pills out to the other members of the party. The effects take a few minutes to kick in. Everyone obeyed. There wasn't time for debate. A consul sat outside the vault. It was similar to the other royal company locks they'd encountered, but this one sparked dangerously. Careful with this one. The voltage in here could leave you wearing a mask like this. The fear in the stranger's voice seemed to make the metal covering her face smolder. Nobody seemed excited to touch the panel, but the banging on the blocked entrance door was enough to enough motivation to start deciphering the symbols. The factory, room four. With a deep groan, the vault door swung open, and everyone heedlessly piled inside to put one more door behind them and their pursuers. However, in their haste, the group neglected to fully turn off the very security system they had bypassed to open the vault door. Alarms sounded, and the vault door locked behind them. Classic. Before anyone could take account of their surroundings, uh, blinding flashes of electricity arched 
across the room. Uh, they arced across the room to the stranger's key, knocking her against the wall and pinning her there. From the shadows at the back of the room, the origin of the electric current moved toward them. A menacing robotic sentry towered in front of them with steel fists clenched. Identify yourselves, it demanded. Instantly, a small pedestal popped out from the wall near the door. The stranger, though winded, winked to the group. The factory, room five. With the sentry powered down, the lights came up to reveal a machine absolutely nothing like anything from the known world. Sleek, stainless steel, uh, frames housed, panes of curved, perfectly clear glass, the precision with which it had been manufactured, and the materials involved made it look alien. Attached to the top of the cylinder were two giant locks, seemingly welded together haphazardly. The locks secured chains that wrapped tightly around the odd machine. This is it, the stranger said. She took the key she'd been carrying and jammed it into an obscure slot in the floor next to the machine. Sparks rained from the ceiling and shot from the floor. I don't know what... I don't know if we'll be back, she said. Everyone, take their meds? The group nodded. Get past those final locks, and we'll have a shot at getting out of here unscathed and well-equipped. So that was the end of the factory. Now I just... If either the Estates or the Royal HQ are next. Let's go with the estates, but keeping in mind that I could have just made an error between these final two scenarios, the estates and the royal HQ. Let's go here with the estates. There wasn't an easy way in. That much was immediately apparent. Perhaps they could have scaled the walls with proper climbing equipment, but that was hard to come by in parallel universe. The gates seemed to have no visible lock, which made it even more intimidating. Almost immediately, a stunningly beautiful woman appeared on the other side of the gate. Her blonde hair glistened almost optimistically in the sun, even in such a serene locale. She stood out. No bindings? Guess y'all aren't planning on staying long. Morellis and Zedric seemed to recognize her immediately. Lottie, any hints on how we open the gate? Zed asked. Well, hello, Lottie, Dr. Elliot quipped without introduction. It's a pleasure to meet you. Old friends, Lottie said with hesitation. Elliot shrugged. I've trusted these misfits with my life for the past 24 hours. What's one more? Lottie gave them a rundown of the area. She let them know which estate vaults had binding bracelets, how to use them uh, to bind to their timeline, and where they might find Wentworth. The tower, of course, she said. So predictable, but I think he feeds off the illusion of power as he watches over an entire city of stolen tech. Typical man, Elizabeth added in a disgusted eye roll. 
Anyone have a cigarette? Charlie had a uh, spare. And you know all of this how, Lottie, Dante was as intrigued as he was attracted to her. Just call me Mrs. Wentworth. Well, don't actually. I hate it. But I'm married to that monster. Come on. Let's go find you all some bracelets. And maybe in turn, you can help me put my husband in the ground. As for this gate, just turn the hatch. Latch. <laughs> As for this gate, just turn the latch. Hatch makes sense to but latch makes even more sense. So here we are in the estates. didn't build houses like this in New London. Anything nice, even in the wealthy districts like New London, would be caked with soot and grime in a matter of days. Here, everything was white. White stucco walls. White trim. White concrete ste uh, streets inlaid with flicks of quartz. But there were no people. The grass lawns were meticulously maintained, but by whom was a mystery. The group peeked inside of a few houses. They were decorated beautifully, but devoid of any life. A white cat came ambling out of one home. It appeared injured with a sizable limp. Then it vanished. Seconds later, it appeared again, ten feet ahead of where it had disappeared. It vomited there, dropping dead on the spot. Morellis hated cats, but a dead one was even worse, as it was sure sign of an unstable timeline. Jacking the cats, the cat owner's house revealed a promising safe, though the lock required two people to work it. States, room two. Excitement grew as the group inspected their newfound bracelets, but it was short lived. They are useless without a charge, Zedric growled, and he'll charge them for a price. That's how he controls this place, his own personal paradise. He keeps the device up in the tower. Our tower, Lottie said, surprisingly chipper for someone on a mission to kill her spouse. But he knows you're coming. He'll be waiting. He loves to play games with people. I've never touched the man, but he enjoys trying to chase and woo me, whatever. Through that next house, you'll find a tunnel in the basement. But the locks for the tunnel is the lock for the tunnel is advanced and. It's mannered, um, it's manned by security guards up in the tower. They'll be controlling it remotely. If we make it through the tunnel, we might be able to reach the tower before more guards show up. The Estates, Room 3. The level of security in this place seemed com uh, at complete odds with who they were going up against. The open gate, houses barely locked, and now bright light flooded the tunnel. They were walking in plain sight, yet no alarms. A lot nicer down here than the underground tunnels I'm used to, Charlie remarked. She felt uneasy about brightly lit passageways. They seemed unnatural. 
The metal door that awaited them beyond a sharp turn was impenetrable. The look on the door glowed with the same sterile light emanating from the figures in the tunnel. Like all the locks they'd seen in this place, it appeared to need four hands to solve it. Then it happened. Dr. Elliot vanished, then Charlie. They reappeared at the entrance of the tunnel, both shaken but with limbs intact. Not good. You're all... Uh, you've all got maybe an hour left before you before you're pulled back. You don't want that. Zedric's tone said they needed to hurry. The Estates, Room 4. The metal door swung open, revealing two guards reaching out for their weapons. Three loud gunshots rose out, followed by the sound of bullets finding their unready targets as Adeline Foley made quick work of the opposition. Morellis hardly blinked. Hurry, up the stairs. We need those bi- uh, we need those binders charged before the group disappeared in front of her eyes and then reappeared suddenly. Axe's glove was gone, revealing his mangled hand. Go, Morella shouted. They reached the entrance to the tower, and sure enough, Wentworth awaited them again behind a barrier. This time, a bulletproof, a bulletproof glass. Peering at it was like looking into a two-way mirror. Every time they made a move on the door's lock, their mirrored likeness did the opposite, actually countering their progress. Dr. Elliot and Charlie began to flicker again. They were out of time. The Estates, Room 5. Morellis was frantic. Charge the bindings! Everything in view shimmered violently, then went out of focus. Inside a warehouse, inside a factory, outside a church. Madigan vomited. Charlie seemed as she, um, excuse me, Charlie screamed as she reappeared suddenly, but with her hand separated from her body by a brick wall. The wall vanished again, but her bloody hand lay twitching on the floor. Dr. Elliot reappeared again, moved quickly to apply a tourniquet. New London, a train charging straight toward them. Then the estates constantly shifting. The shimmers stopped. They were back in the factory with royal guards shouting. Morales screamed as her body absorbed a dozen bullets. Then, back in the tower, Morales was gone, as was Wentworth. The charge station was in front of them, but it needed its security system disabled. There was surely enough power left to charge all the bindings, but was there enough time? The Royal HQ. This might be last or second to last, and if I figure that out when I'm editing this video, I'll put it in the right order. If not, it might just be out of order by one. But hopefully you still get the, the ideas behind each of them. I might be saying this preemptively depending on my editing, but thank you very much for checking out this video. I want to thank you for being interested in the plot and fluff and theme, bearing with me as I ramble my best in the lighting I have here to get through the plot and fluff, but it is incredibly interesting to me. Please subscribe, like, comment if you want, and let me know what you'd like to see more of, less of, or other games or subjects you'd like to have me talk, read, or speak about. 
Thanks again, and here we go with the Royal HQ. The concrete slab under their feet was the only thing familiar, compared to the dank environs of the room they'd left moments ago. The sight of healthy grass and a clear blue sky was stunning. They realized they stood atop a cliff. The smell and taste of salt in the damp air hinted at water nearby, but nothing visible from their current vantage point was cloaked in a heavy, almost drinkable mist. Anything visible covered in mist. We have to move. The stranger began to walk as she talked. They have found ways to remain here safely. We do not yet have this luxury, so our binding is weak. If we get pulled back and end up inside a wall, a piece of metal, anything really, heaven help us. Their lungs almost didn't know what to do with all the fresh air. Each breath filled them with energy they had never felt. On occasion, one could find an oxygen peddler in New London, where a few coins might grant you a few minutes of clean air. Of course, the definition of clean in New London was always up for debate, and the peddler's business were usually short-lived. This, on the other hand, was something entirely different. This was real. This was pure. And yet, there was something entirely off about their location. They could touch, smell, see, and, and taste everything. It was almost too real. The sensory overload left them all questioning their reality. Nobody said it aloud, but every now and then, some would see a flicker or shimmer in their field of vision. Naturally, each member of the group assumed they were the only ones seeing it. The group followed the stranger. What choice did they have at this point? Madigan and Axe trailed all at the back, suspicion of what might be behind them, or maybe they'd have a, um, or maybe they'd have a head start in the event of a retreat was needed. But there was no threat in sight. The salty breeze increased as they approached the edge of the cliff, and they drew closer. And as they drew closer, they could make out a rickety elevator precariously attached to the rock. It looked as if a strong gust could send it free-falling into the unknown below. Royal HQ, Room 1. To say the elevator seemed in disrepair would have been a gross understatement. Rusted and dilapidated, it stood in stark contrast to the machine in which they'd arrived. It looked like it belonged in New London. A few of the group's more brave members peered down and saw the roof of a small building poking out of a sea of fog directly below them. Down there, the stranger pointed. That's where we'll find him. Who? Dr. Elliot asked, politely. Forgive my questions, but we don't even know where we are, and we've all just consumed medication without even knowing the effects. There will be time for that later. They could tell she was irritated. Every second we spend here is a risk. We have nothing to stabilize ourselves in the, this timeline. It's time to get that elevator working. We're headed down. The Royal HQ, room two. A classic ding announced their arrival to ground level. The elevator doors opened into an opulent room everything trimmed in an unrecognizable metal. A man stood behind a large oval table, waiting for them. 
The same flickers seen atop the cliff formed a barrier of sorts between the group and the man. Greetings, he said, with sarcastic enthusiasm. Welcome to the Royal Company Lobby. My name is Wentworth, and I just wanted to uh, meet the ones causing such a ruckus back in New London before. Um, Forgive me. I just wanted to meet the ones causing such a ruckus back in New London before I deal with you. He casually popped a capsule into his mouth. I'm afraid this place is inhospitable to those not bound to it. It will be amusing to see how long you last. My bet is on you in this silly hat. He clearly pointed at uh, the secret agent who wears the silly hat. He stopped backward into a small machine. I can't read today. I'm really sorry. It's the font in this. Now I continue my call. He stepped backward into a small machine with a familiar key already inserted. A countdown began. The power switch to this pod is on the table. He goaded, looking directly at the stranger. But mind the rift barrier. The Royal HQ, Room 3. The flickering dissipated, and everyone made a lunge for the switch. It was too late. The transport pod closed, scaling Wentworth off from the others. He was sealed off from them. Um, As he calmly adjusted his black gloves and re-slicked his oily hair. You can't win he taunted from behind the glass. New London. Think of it as a giant waste bin. A wry smile crept across his lips. And you are its trash. Everything undesirable is sent there. Criminals, rebels, the sick. His voice trailed off. New London's only use to us is the power and coal it provides for the pills you took to get here. But I'm growing bored, so if you'll excuse me, I have a bet to place on Miss Clueless in Hat. Wentworth flipped a small trigger inside the pod, and in a blinding flash, he was gone. Steel bars slid across all exits, and a countdown started blaring from a speaker overhead. Charlie, find a way to turn that off so we can think, the stranger directed. As an electronic tablet on the desk caught her eye. Ideas, anyone? She asked, holding up the device. The Royal HQ, Room 4. The walls began to shimmer like liquid evaporating into thin air. Piece by piece, the entire room began to blink away, revealing the epicenter of the Royal Company's HQ. Clapping echoed off the wall, uh, off the walls, as a strange man with dreadlocks and a top hat approached. For this being your first time in the big city, I respect your efforts. Though most of your escape was my doing, he said. The name's Zedric. I've been assigned to offer you aid. Just enough to keep you alive while the company watches. It's a game to them. It was then that Zedric noticed the stranger and turned white as a sheet. Um, mm, Morellis, he stammered. I thought you were killed in a rift distortion. They showed me your face. Morellis only stared, letting the silence build. Finally, she spoke up. I'm not that easy to kill, Zed. 
You up for finishing what we started? Shocked turned to determination. Oh, I'm in. But this place... You need to be bound to this reality. For that, we need a Riftwalker. Again, thanks for tuning in with me. Hope I have the order correct as you watch these now. And I appreciate your patience and hopefully enjoying the fluff text, flavor text, and story that is either there or hinted at and implied. The rest of it, the rest of it is played out with how the mechanisms of this beautiful abstract game unfold as we each play. Thank you.